Okay, um, so thanks for having me. Thank you for this wonderful introduction. Um, and even though you've mentioned a lot of my accolades, I'm still quite nervous to be here because the names before me are more famous than me. So everybody knows Netflix, right? Um, plus, I'm going to do something like real weird before I start, start talking. Um, so for me, you guys here are rock stars because because of you, the GraphQL community even exists and is spreading and my head is like exploding with new ideas just because of the past few days. So I'm just going to do a quick photo. <laughs> so smile. <laughs> okay, now to the fun stuff. Um, so yeah, as said, uh, we're doing caching on a quite different level than most of the talks I've heard before mine. So we're doing a per field caching mechanism, which is quite a fun and uh, novel idea, I guess. And I need to ask you a question. So how many people here are having trouble with caching? Well, some, some. So uh, not that many, which means that uh, the caching techniques are improving and we are getting new ideas. Um, and before I get into the caching mechanism on its own, I need to explain uh, where I'm from. So I'm from this lovely city called Ljubljana. Uh, our company is based in Europe. We do a lot of software development, but we also do business intelligence. So we're a little bit of both. Quite a unique and fun combination. And the project uh, we were working on, so the backstory that led to this idea, of course, is microservices. So two years ago, when we started uh, thinking about uh, building an app, everything was based on microservices, and we decided to go into microservices as well, because it's the new hipster trend, and why not use it? Um, and well, this led to, so the project we were doing was connected to the post office of Slovenia. And the idea was to get all of their apps into one big ecosystem. Um, more just like the apps you're using at Google. So single sign-in and all the rest of the stuff that comes with that. And we started with an application called EasyDocs, which with the underlying ecosystem is comprised of like 20 plus microservices and 10 databases. So we put this on OpenShift and then we gradually went into production. And what happened was is we were like getting this insane network traffic loads plus insane database loads. And the most uh, depressing thing for me was when at 2 a.m. I got a phone call from uh, the DevOps people, which usually don't sleep at all. Um, <laughs> And they said to me, uh, well, there's really a lot of stuff going on, so I keep increasing the resources you have, and um, what are you guys running? Is, is it a spaceship or what? And I said, okay, we'll look into it. And now I have another question for you, because the next two slides are totally dependent upon how much people know this thing, but I'm guessing you do. How many have seen Back to the Future? Okay. Um, so the thing is that when I was thinking about how to reduce these problems we're having is the idea kind of came at a weird moment. So <laughs> usually when people get ideas, it's like in different places, but in my case, it was under the shower, true story. Um, and it was kind of like an epiphany dog head in Back to the Future when he had that idea for the flux capacitor when he hit his head. I didn't hit my head. Uh, but it just kind of came to me. So why couldn't we? Because a lot of our requests that were coming in were fetching different fields because our APIs were public. And I was kind of wondering, could we try to cache stuff in a different way? So using caching on fields. and. Then we decided, okay, we are using the Apollo server, and they have this wonderful support for directives, and we decided to actually test this stuff out. So the idea on paper sounded great. Um, so put your fields, uh, put your directives on the fields, uh, test it out, and uh, the thing was that 
we kind of needed to dig in a bit deeper. So raise your hands if anyone has actually kind of driven a bit, bit a deeper into the info object or the AST. A few hands. So it's kind of like going deep down the rabbit hole because it's like this humongous object that gives you a lot of information on the schema itself. And we actually need this information. So if we want to do a per field caching mechanism, we need to get the fields that are being fetched. And the first prototype was kind of bored on a whiteboard. So there's a lot of gibberish going on around here. Uh, we were kind of planning stuff out, how to do stuff. Is it even feasible to go into this? Um, and we kind of said, OK, let's do it. So the solution was, before actually triggering the resolver, let's check which fields we are fetching and check with an, with an existing cache. So we used Redis for our implementation. And then when this is done, send the fields we need to fetch to the resolver. And then the resolver goes and fetches the data it needs, and stuff happens. So there's a simple query here, for instance. We are fetching a user by ID, uh, and we are fetching some fields. And the fields that are cached here are name and bar. So let's imagine that this request is happening for the first time. So what's going to happen is that we are going to be uh, fetching all the data for the first time, right? Um, and what, happened as, what happens afterwards is we check if a key with user and ID exists in Redis. It doesn't, which means that we don't have a cached object yet. Then we fetch the fields from our services. We get them. We store them in Redis. We return the data to the client. And that's basically it. And then afterwards, let's say that another request happens that is like an insanely good scenario for us. So we are fetching two fields that are already in the cache itself for a specific user. Uh, what happens now is we go into Redis. The cache exists. It hasn't expired. So this is the most optimal scenario that exists. And this means that we won't be fetching any data from our services at all. And we just return this data to the client. And with this like really small idea, we managed to reduce our network traffic. Our DB loads got lower. Our service calls were decreased. And we kind of find out, OK, we use Mongo for our microservices. But this can basically be used with any database layer. Because most of all, we're fetching fields. I'm not saying that this applies to every case out there. but. Uh, we are going potentially be testing it with other databases as well. And what are we doing right now with this is we are going to test machine learning in production. So we get like a bunch of requests to our server. And we are kind of trying to use machine learning to predict what the data going to be in advance that our users will be querying. And with that, we can actually try to do a dynamic caching mechanism for our fields in advance. And this all could be done without reloading the server, because you don't need to reload the schema in order to get the caching time for all of your fields. Uh, we're also trying out federation support. And basically, we haven't covered all the cases the community has, because a lot of the schemas between different companies is different. That's why we're kind of asking for your support. So I already got a question, how do you solve interfaces and unions? And I said, OK, we don't have interfaces and unions in our schema. So let's try to solve that problem. Um, so uh, we're trying to release this thing into the community. Of course, it's going to be an NPM package first, because we're doing Apollo. Uh, but I encourage you to visit the site. It's just a simple landing page. Uh, you can leave your email address if you want to, to be notified when we release it. But if you're skeptical about leaving your email address, I certainly am sometimes. Uh, you can also follow me on Twitter uh, to see when this thing is released. Um, and before I finish up this talk, I'd also like to thank my fellow engineer, Marco, uh, he isn't here today, but he was quite, um, qu 
quite a wild animal when he was researching the info object. So without him, none of this would practically exist. <laughs> and also, none of this would also exist if result didn't encourage us to follow new ideas. So when I proposed this idea, they were immediately, OK, let's go into it, even if it doesn't do anything. And of course, Apollo and the community itself, without them, none of us would be here. Uh, and if you need more info, again, I'll be posting a few Medium articles in detail how this thing works. Um, I didn't want to go all into technical details here. Uh, plus, you can also do your own implementations in the meantime, because it's a really simple thing to do. Uh, and again, if you're hoping for a secret ending, like in the Marvel movies, there isn't one. So that's all. Thank you.